Um, what I wanted to, um, I'll be presenting with Chad, actually Chad Checkups will be doing most of the presentation. Chad has been uh, both a practitioner at companies such as Nabisco, uh, Nielsen, um, H.J. Hines, H.J. Hines, uh, as well as a consultant and trainer for the last uh, couple of decades. And uh, what uh, we had worked together actually over the last, very closely together, the really last uh, 15 years or so. Um, and one of the things I really wanted to cover when we talk about this idea of experience and again thinking about the, the concept of immersive learning, that we don't get caught up in, and this is something that, that Ron spoke about as well, we don't get caught up in um, when somebody says I need a sim, that we immediately think it means e-learning or one thing or another. The idea is, again, if we're focusing on the experience, we're focusing on both the individual experience of what is going to be played, but also the experience of how it's deployed, sometimes it's important to make sure that you broaden the, your, your perspective on how it is that you might deploy. And I find it, have found it very interesting. When I started doing simulation, the only place to do it was in the classroom. Right, the computer tools in the 80s and 90s did not allow for, there wasn't CBT yet. Everything that was done, there was computer-aided instruction in the classroom. And that was the only thing, that was the only way to do it. And e-learning obviously came subsequently, but the model associated with SIM in the classroom is a very, very powerful model, and one that I feel has gotten short shrift, especially with the uh, cuts that happened and when e-learning actually became an option how many organizations were out there that said we're going to totally cut our training budgets because we're going to take away completely the opportunity for classroom. It's just too expensive to fly people anywhere, to hook them up, and then to have the facilities to actually do it. And so those things really came and squashed out the whole idea of classroom training in many instances in many organizations. And in fact, we've lost something in that, I believe. Now obviously classroom sometimes is just not realistic because of where people are coming from. But it is important to understand the model because I think that the approach that went into designing sims, or using sims in a blended approach in the classroom has a lot of elements that can be utilized in a virtual space. So it's not that it has to be done in the classroom, but we do want you to understand how this is designed when you take <coughs> instructions, so instructor-led content, blend it with a computer-based simulation, and often this can manifest as a role play, so it doesn't have to be computer-based from an experience standpoint. And then you blend that into the overall flow of a design. And what happens is, is that, so if we all agree here that simulations are a very powerful way to learn, we've certainly made that case uh, from a number of different perspectives. But when you take the power of simulation and you couple it with the power of group dynamics, when you put people, uh, groups of people into a simulation, where they take over the life of whoever's simulated on screen and do it together, you increase that power dramatically. I'd like to say exponentially, but I can't prove that. Uh, but you, we'll improve up, it. you increase the power dramatically. Because not only are you giving them the opportunity to learn from what's on the screen, from the power of the, of the tool that's been created, but you're giving them the opportunity to learn from their peers. You're giving them an opportunity to learn from each other. Because now they not only face the situation as they would do it, but they get to hear, see, experience, and sometimes argue about how somebody else would do it. Remember the idea of the apple hanging down and whose perspective is right. I don't know what the other person would do until they tell me what they're going to do. And now I have a non-confrontational way of actually attending to it. We did simulations back um, in the 90s related to diversity. You know, how many, when, when diversity was in its heyday, as far as a training requirement, and the issues in diversity, how many people had to come face to face with their biases, and it was a very difficult course to build when you're talking about have, forcing people to have to engage with deep-seated behaviors that they had, even if they didn't realize they were doing it. And you have to do it in a way that doesn't make them feel bad on the one hand, or at least not badly enough that they tune out everything else, but to actually deal with the issues. And simulation was a wonderful tool for doing that, especially when they got to do it with their peers where there was an opportunity for a mirror to be held up to their faces. But again, not by saying you are bad, but by saying this is what's happening. Why would you say something? Why would you take, make that decision 
Uh, do you realize that and, and understanding some of the consequences, but also then being able to give it to the feedback. So I wanted, wanted to take a little bit of time at the conference to really, if you haven't seen it before, to really understand what the model is like when you talk about blending simulation into the classroom and to see then um, what that causes for you in terms of your thinking as it might apply because you can do it again virtually. You can deploy things from a, uh, a virtual perspective. And it's always fun to, uh, we're going to try using the audience response units because I think it's also important that when we talk about experience as the survey monkey example, you really may be able to do it without the high fidelity, without the high end approach, just thinking things through uh, in terms of how you want to design it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chad and we'll take it from there. Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> I wrestled a little bit with how do you demonstrate simulation in the classroom, and especially how do you do it in an hour. So we're going to roll up your sleeves and give you a real quick overview of a process that's very engaging. Uh, we start off with why are you here, and I'm going to rock it through a couple of these because they were set up that Ken has already done very well for me. Uh, what is it that you want to learn? What would you like to learn in this session? What would be valuable for you to walk away with from this? This is the non-rhetorical portion of the program. <laughs> How do you utilize simulation to make that face-to-face training more engaging? Okay, good. Yeah. And the rest of you can sleep through the presentation. Then. We can do it when it's a good time to do it. When to do it and when not to do it. When's the best way to do it? Good. Good. We'll address all of those. If any of you have any that we haven't mentioned, or as we get through the program, you have them come up, raise your hand, let's deal with them. And so we thought, rather than instructing you about it, we'd let you experience it. Because I believe that experience is the best teacher, and it'll probably stimulate some questions you wouldn't have asked if I had stood up here and lectured for the next 20 minutes or so. Let me give you a quick overview that'll kind of give some context to what you're about to experience. Um, in this session, we're going to be talking about how do you do blended learning. And blended learning is really the intersection of some instructor-led with some simulation. But the beauty of it is, if you do your simulation in small groups, you really vastly expand the learning platform because each participant is also going to be learning from discussions they have in their teams. And the nicest thing of all is I can deliver a simulation that's parallel in your environment. It may not be a perfect fit to your environment, but during these discussions, we bring it directly into your environment and talk about how, you know, what are the problems you're having that are parallel to this in your immediate context, and we start to resolve problems in my job environment in the program rather than talking about some hypothetical widget manufacturer that our company is nothing like. So we'll show you how to integrate that into the classroom. I'll talk just a little bit about some of the benefits. We'll rock it through those because Will Tallheimer taught you all about the benefits of this. And, and I'll kind of show you how this fits into his CETA model because, boy, it's a perfect way to do your training and really have it be CETA certified, I guess. I don't know that that's a term, but... <laughs> And then when do you do it? When is it good and when is it less good? So let's talk about those. Um, just very quickly, some of the benefits is it aligns the learning that's going to be done with a real honest to goodness life context. It leverages the power of retrieval and repetition. You'll hear me say things, you'll see their application in the sim, and then you'll have an opportunity to discuss it as groups. What's really neat about the simulation is we don't give you right or wrong answers in the sim. Uh, where a lot of simulations are there for instructive purposes, sims in the classroom are strictly provocative. And so you'll see some funny things, you'll see some really strange things, but anything that evokes discussion is what we want to do. Because that's where the learning is going to take place. Will didn't talk about little paradigm drawers, and I'd like to for 10 seconds. Adults, when we learn, it's really hard for us to learn something that's brand new. 
because most of us have had such a breadth of experience that we got a paradigm up there for just about everything. And so the very best way to get an adult to learn is to get them to open up their paradigm drawer, take that little paradigm out, and then bounce what you're saying against that or what I'm experiencing against that paradigm. And if I can find a way to plug that in and enhance my paradigm, that is eternally um, evocable, something that I can bring back and play against in the future. My retention of it goes way up, and the probability of me using it likewise goes way up. So we leverage the power not only of repetition, but the staying power of retrieval. It expands our experience portfolio. And when I talk about opening up our little <coughs> paradigm drawer, those are all of our experiences. And the first thing we do, most of leadership today, is really a challenge to do things that haven't been done before. And so when we face a situation that we've never faced before, the first thing we do is we go to our experience portfolio and pick up something that is as close as possible. I'll show you the details on that. But what we're doing with this simulation is really expanding your portfolio beyond things that you might have an opportunity to really experience in the real world. So it's growing your experience portfolio. And it provides you feedback as you go, as we have discussions, you'll see about three or four opportunities for feedback as you get exposed to the stuff that we're going to show you. And it encourages critical thinking. I want to talk about critical thinking for just a second. Most of us know what it is, but I want to show you how this really enables and, and it encourages the process of critical thinking. We run into a problem and usually the first thing that we do is we go to our experience portfolio. What have I experienced that's similar to this? And following that, we usually identify then, based on that experience, here's an action that I'm going to take. We plug in that action to the situation that we're in and we get our results. And then we go back and deal with all of the problems that come because that experience that I had isn't exactly like the experience that I dealt with. It's a little bit different. And I, and I learn from this process. It's extremely dangerous because in a lot of situations we can't afford to make mistakes. So critical thinking is taking away this and expanding it by first of all considering what are all the options? What are the different decision points that I could be making here? And I hope you see how simulation could encourage that. The next thing we do is look at, now, for each decision point that I have, for each choice option that I have, what are my possible content, my, my, my potential consequences of those? And when I thought through all of those, then I analyze those and come up with my strategy, and then I move to action. And this whole process is called critical thinking. We don't get a lot of people to actually do this, but what, what I found is when people begin to go through simulation and see this process, it becomes part and parcel of their thought process, and we get better decisions coming out of managers as a result. So let's show you how this whole process works. Let's show you how to integrate it in. The first thing we do is we set the stage, we'll be playing some scenarios, and then we're going to do a debrief. I encourage you to kind of take some notes on um, the process itself. We're going to review it when we're finished, but I'd like to have you have an opportunity to see the process we're going through a couple of times. Um, we are now going to simulate for about three minutes a piece of instruction that you might be giving. And I've chosen to use a simulation that we developed for a telecommunications group. I picked something intentionally that was focused on soft skills. In fact, the scorecard for this per particular simulation is inspiration. Now, how do you measure inspiration? Are you being inspiring? This was a uh, simulation that was for the C-suite at this telecommunications company, and they wanted them to focus on expanding the vision, increasing and being inspiring inspirational to people, and they defined being inspirational as positive about the mission, always being positive about your mission, 
knowing who your allies are uh, so that you can put together consortiums when necessary. And one of the third ones, that they had a longer list than this, I picked out a couple or three, was, was presence or time that you spend with your peers and superiors and communication is certainly very important. So this is the scorecard that they were working on. So we developed a quick bit of, of training that I'll give you now. Um, inspiration is really the ability to create and to build commitment in others. And so here's our commitment and our vision that we want to build. How do we go about doing that? Well, I've discovered that this vision is a factor of three things. Number one, the desirability of the vision. If we find that it's not desirable, um, if I should for some reason think that that's not a desirable destination, then my commitment to that is going to be pretty minimal. It's my desirability plus feasibility. How feasible is it that I can get to that destination? And that feasibility is multiplied by a factor we call activation. And activation is how much energy am I going to put into this? So let me, let me define activation. Activation is if I look at my desired future and I consider the obstacles that I'm going to have to overcome, that becomes the, those are the two factors that, that engage activation. So, if I were to have a future that was not particularly desirable, how would you, if I, if I viewed this vision as not particularly valuable, what would you as a leader need to do to in, increase my commitment? Reduce the obstacles. Excellent. If I were to reduce my obstacles, that would make this a larger number and get the activation times the feasibility to get my commitment up. Is that the only option I have? Increase the effort. Okay, and this is the effort. So how would I increase that effort if in fact I don't think that that's a very desirable future? Increase my, how do you change my vision of it? Good, good. You'll need to, so the, my two options are, I either need to spend some time and improve your perception of what that future vision is, or I need to recognize, what did I just do? I need to recognize what my obstacles are and some way I need to reduce those obstacles. Okay? Now. We could go on and we don't need to go any further. You've had your little bit of instruction. And I'd probably it'd be fun to go around the room and ask how many of you actually learned something from that instruction. Uh, I won't go there. Um, but now we'll give you an opportunity to actually utilize that. And the beauty of simulation is it takes this content and gives you an opportunity now to apply it in a real world environment and get some feedback on how well you did. <coughs> so here we're in a simulation. All of you now work for ET Corporation, Energy Technologies Corporation, and you are Pat Smith. And uh, if you can open up my organization chart down here, Kenny. It's the, uh, okay, that works. Can you, Pat Smith's off on the other side over here. You're off the map already. Here we go. You're Pat Smith, so you're part of the executive committee. You're actually uh, vice president of, what do you call her, him? Uh, VP of customer relations okay, for ET Corporation. That's your role. You have been with ET Corporation for three or four years. 
Um, and you have got two or three employees that seem to be on a stellar track. Um, I'll go ahead and read the information. We'll hurry and get you to a point where you can make a decision, and then I will ask you to use your little choice things to make a decision. I'm going to ask you to do this let's, like a real group would do. So I, I'll divide you up into a couple of groups. We'll take people on the first couple rows here. Let's make you a small group and include some of the folks back here, and then another small group here. We'll make you an entire group. We'll divide you into half and make you a group, and then in the back a group, and then we'll make you a group over here. And I would like each of you, as a group, are to play the role of Pam Smith, or Pat Smith, I'm sorry, I, it's a, supposed to be a gender neutral name. Pat Smith, um, go ahead and take us to the next event. These are your strategic initiatives for ET Corporation. The one that you need to focus on are, we want to decrease customer support costs. And that ends up being your area of responsibility. So the rest of these are interesting, but for the three or four scenarios you're going to be addressing, you need to remember that we need to decrease our customer support costs. Okay, Ken? <clears throat> it's nine o'clock in the morning. I'm gonna read you this one. And you're about to have a day that it's already been a day to remember. She came in with a smile, handed you an envelope, said less than four sentences, and was gone all in about a minute. Julie Farnsworth was the director of customer service support, or customer support, and for less than uh, for less than two years, but tr tried to turn ET's fourth most profitable business unit around. A year ago, when Donald Trumpet, who's your CEO, chided you for not having a viable replacement, you thoroughly analyzed available talent and started grooming Julie as your replacement. She was quickly recognized as your heir apparent and became a visionary kind of pied piper. But all of that ended today when she came in and handed you her resignation. Okay, let's go to the next one. Reeling from total surprise, you begin to consider what are your next steps. Which of the following would you do first? Get into your groups, I'll give you about a minute. Discuss your three options, your, or your four options. The first one is to begin considering a replacement. Julie's position is mission critical. And you're gonna to need to have a replacement as soon as possible. Uh-oh, the rumor mills. Um, you, outside of your office door, you hear several people talking, and one of them happens to mention that they've heard a rumor that Julie is leaving and going to talent industries. And uh, one of them asks, is it just for the money? And the other one says, no, I don't think so, but the money certainly was a factor. I think she's been looking, uh, she was hoping for a counter offer, offer here, except that she didn't see any opportunity for innovation as much as she has at talent industry. So her loss is our loss. Okay, you can close that up. Option number two is to inform Julie's subordinates. They're going to want to know because if this is going to, a wave of concern is going to go through the organization when they hear this. Number three, inform the executive committee keeping them posted, they're your, some of your major stakeholders, keeping them posted is pretty important. And last is pay a visit to the customer service center. That's where Julie has all of her subordinates. Which would you do? Go. Take about a minute to discuss before you start voting. Point. 
Okay, take about 10 seconds to wrap up your conversations. Make your choice. I mean, I'm going to you down the don't vote yet. Don't vote yet. Nobody vote yet. What I'd like you to do before we vote now, I need to give you an opportunity for some healthy I told you so's. And I, I love um, the diversity of the discussions that happen. So first of all, I'd like you to take this piece of paper. We're on the very first decision called reeling. And I would like you to put a mark in there. Uh, you'll put an X for you personally. Which one of those do you think is the best? Then, when your team came to a decision, I'd like you to put a T in the block that your team decided. This is so that we can go back afterwards and you can kind of do a little bit of comparative analysis. So only under number one, you have to decide whether you, on option number one, two, three, or four, which one did you decide with an X, and which one did the team decide on with a T. Don't worry about the group, we'll get there later. We're the team. Uh, yeah. We're the extra pages. Yeah. Oh, didn't we get pages? Okay. There's more right here. Just one decided team. Got to have one. Well, three of us decided three. We get to decide the team. The one person on the team. Everybody has to do it. I have to do it. Yeah, everybody will have to. Everybody will have to. Yeah. They just put a T on the Okay, I'm going to go around now. Before you vote, I'm going to go around and ask what each of the teams decided. And then when we're finished, we'll actually actually have you vote your individual and it'll total them up here and that's how we'll make the decision. Can you put the choices back on the screen, Ken, one more time? So before I start an investigation, I think I would want to testing the edges of technology here. Number one was to begin considering a replacement. Number two is to inform Julie's subordinates. Number three was to inform the executive committee. And number four was to plan a visit to the visitor center, customer, customer service center, which is where Julie's command center is. Okay, let's start over here. What did the team decide to do? Executives, okay. Executives. Executive, boy, I'm telling you guys. Executive. 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 Support center. Support center. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, excellent. Excellent. One group that got it wrong. <laughs> oh, sorry. Did I say that? Ready? <laughs> okay. Let's everybody vote. Wait, wait until it comes up. Give me one second until it comes up. Are you voting individually? Now you're voting individually. So if you didn't agree, executive. Which may or may not be the best answer. Vote for the one that you really thought it should be. And by the way, if anybody has come up with an idea that wasn't an option, based on what you would do, note that. Yes. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Write it. Write it down. I wouldn't do any of those. This is what I would do. Is everybody done? Voting is finished. Yeah. Early drinking. Oh, choice three. <laughs> you know, three, four, and two. Okay, choice number three. If you'll make that selection for us, inform the executive committee, and go to the next one. The results of you informing the executive committee. You quickly reach out to all the members of the executive committee and inform them of Julie's sudden resignation. Don Perignon, who happens to be your VP of operations, and Sharp Pointer, your guy that's in finance and admin, both are both in and immediately they come to your office. The three of you discuss Julie's departure and agree on a strategic communication strategy based on candor and optimism. Before leaving your office, Sharp says, what are your thoughts about a replacement? Have you had time to start to put together a plan? You admit that you haven't had time, but ask if both of them would be willing to provide you some input over the next few days, and both agree and make their exit. Let's go to the next event. After Dome and Sharp, Dom and Sharp leave, um, you dig through your files and find the hiring criteria you listed when you filled out Julie's 
position the last time and suddenly there's a knock on your door and when you say come in four of your managers from the call center come into your office each has a look of concern and you immediately know that this will not be a short meeting you invite the managers to your office and begin to explain the events of the morning the look of concern in each of their faces seems to deepen sensing that you should address their anxiety at the outset you pause and ask, what are your concerns? The questions start to fly. Who's going to replace Julie? What are the changes you're going to have, we're going to have to implement? Why did she really leave? And you respond, your choices are, number one, explain that things were on, are on hold for a little while. This will get, and you've given the circumstance, this is about all that you can really say at this point. Option number two is tell them what you know. Uh, while you don't know much, you can help build their trust by telling them what you do know. Number three is tell them you don't have answers quite yet. While they seem to need reassurance right now, it might be better to buy, to buy yourself a little bit of time. And finally, ask for their input. This is an opportunity for you to gain information from their perspective and help them participate in the process. You now have one minute. Discuss it amongst your teams and identify what you would do. Go. I think we're going to look at what our objective is. I think we're going to look at what our objective is. I think we're going to look at what our objective is. I think we're going to look at what our objective is. I think we're I would tell her I know. Yeah. 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 Okay, about 10 seconds to wrap it up. I'm beginning to explain the events of this morning. I know you told them to keep them on. Okay, let's start with our wrong team this time. What did you guys decide to do on this one? Number three, and why? So <laughs> let's get over two weeks. We won't do much, and we don't set anybody on edge by putting all the projects on the manager. Excellent. Well, this team would decide. Two. Number two. Okay, and your logic for that was. Uh, logic? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's well, supposed to be logic. You know, we're, we're kind of split, but we're, we're, I, se sequentially in the conversation, it seemed to make sense that we would tell them what we know, then ask for input. Mm -hmm. Okay. And would okay. that be reassuring to say, look, we've already discussed with the executive team, this is our plan over the next few days, that would offer some reassurance, not yeah. 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 Excellent point. Can you start to see how discussion can happen as you do this? It's a neat tool. What did we decide? We're split like they are between two and four. Somewhere between two and four. Now, what I've done uh, somewhat violates what Will talked about because we've given you a limited set of options. So a really good option I could add on there are none of the above. But actually, in a classroom situation, you really don't want that to happen. You want to force them to have these discussions, and you want them to be a little uncomfortable, because as we do the feedback session, you're going to get that input. And at that point, we can ask, okay, what would you do? What is the, in your particular situation, what's even a better response? And we can start to elicit some of that open-ended. We'd like to leave you with a little bit of angst out of this so that we have a nice fiery discussion during the feedback session so but i'm going to make you commit one or two or two or four okay while you're considering <laughs> what do you guys decide to do okay a little more angst but we'll go ahead and let the wind blow us over to four which gives us an opportunity to recant later on and say well you forced us i like it it's a strategic answer Number two, okay, it seemed to be kind of split everybody between two and four. Okay, let's go and do one more, and then we'll take you to the feedback session. Uh, oh yes, let's do the voting. Okay, 
For the one that we just went, I'd like you each individually now to vote. Go. Okay, we're at our 30. Oops, somebody else is voting on this one that didn't vote on the last one. We're good. Okay, Ken, the results are number two. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Well, let's make choice number two then. When do we get fired? Choice number two, tell them what you know. And then go to the next one. And we'll just do one more. You depart. The managers depart from your office, okay. and the call center, call center managers listen to what you've had to say, and they leave it mumbling under their breath, muttering some foul things that you're glad that you can't overhear, and you had no time to construct a clear message before they came to you, and you wish that you'd postpone delivering some of what you felt was important for you to deliver. Let's we go to the next one. On and you visit the call center. Now, when you visit the call center, just a little bit of background information, Julie had been setting this up to go automated so that you would ultimately be able to close your call center down. She was working with an internet solution that would allow people to directly order their parts. Oh, we had an interruption. Uh, this is an interesting bulletin that comes out from Talent Industries. It's a kind of an announcement that says that Julie Farnsworth, their talent technologies, is excited to announce that Julie Farnsworth has been appointed as worldwide vice president of customer relations. Saul Wellengood, Talon's president, said today that Julie brings Talon a great record, a track record of success at ET Corporation, kind of a in your face. Uh, when she implemented, where she implemented a, a series of initiatives that demonstrated her talent for creativity and innovation. So, they're excited about getting her. Let's move off of that one. Back to the call center. Uh, <coughs> told you a little bit about that one. She was implementing a state-of-the-art facility where one of her subordinates, Yashir Yabecha, is apparently waiting for your arrival. Let's go ahead to the next one. You can hardly wait to meet Yashir, can't you? Good guy. During her last few months, Julie had been talking about transfer of the call center business completely to the internet. Her idea was developed and installed uh, and, and install a self-diagnostic program for the P3 engine that's listed on the internet. She believed that this coupled with the existing replacement module would totally automate repair and maintenance, allowing her to downsize the call center and drastically reduce costs. Yasser's tone seems deliberately neutral. How do you respond? Okay, here we go. Well, this will be our last one. Number one, do you think of Julie's, what do you think of Julie's idea? These are the questions that you may want to ask Yasher. What do you think of Julie's idea? Yasher's bound to have a perspective, and you'd be remiss if you didn't ask for it. Question number two, that sounds terrific. Yasher is bringing you an idea, and it would be good for you to show how your enthusiasm for it. Number three, I'm not convinced that that sounds like a good idea. See if Yasher can, can convince you of the idea's merit. And finally, number four, does Art, the webmaster for customer relations, support this idea? Stakeholder analysis is part of what you're doing, and you need to start to analyze where everybody else is at on this. Yasher is now the default head of the customer center. He was second in command under Julie. How would you come to the conclusion that he's a yes man? Maybe. 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 First of all, his voice was neutral. There's a red flag here. Okay, take about 10 seconds and wrap it up. Let's start here in the center this time. What did you guys agree to do? Number one. Okay. What did you guys agree to do? Number one. Up here. Number one. 
Uh oh, conformity. I'm not liking that. One. One. Number four. Thank you. Number four. Okay, let's have you vote individually. Mark on your sheet of paper which one the team agreed to. And now you're voting your conscience. All right, Ken. The team says number one. Okay, give us choice number one. <clears throat> I'm going to have Ken now finish off the rest of the sim and take us to the feedback page. But traditionally what we would do now, and this is what we'll actually do here, is we'll print feedback, and we typically do that to a little PDF file. Everybody has their computer with, so they bring up this PDF file, and you get to read your feedback. Kenny, why don't you go ahead and take us to the, I think we need to, yeah, there you go. All the way down to end of feedback, right there. Okay, let's do a quick overview of scores just for fun. We didn't deal with the first one under vision. This is the one we wanted to talk about. We actually did pretty good under inspiration. We were positive about our mission 50% of the time, and the other two we got 100% on. And let's go in and take a real quick look at our feedback. Now, what we do at this point, everyone has had a chance to read their feedback, and everybody picks one or two scenarios that they were particularly perplexed with, or they didn't like the feedback that they got. And we're going to discuss those. So as we glance through your feedback up here, I'd like you to pick one or two, one of these scenarios that we'd like to talk about, and I'll show you how we go about doing this. Um, in fact, I, I know which one we want to talk about, and it's the one that they didn't do too well on. This one tells you the very first choice we were reeling. Uh, we made the choice that we would go to the executives first. It says that thinking about leadership, this is your best approach because in order to maintain inspiration, you're going to want to take a positive spin on this. And the executive group input is going to be absolutely important to be able to come out with a joint message that everyone is going to hear the same from everyone on. None of the rest of those options gave you that. Okay? And as important as it is to begin to talk with her peers, this one is a better solution. Probably not the best, and I'll ask you about that in a minute. Let's go to number two. This one was the one where we asked next steps. Okay, you've decided what you're going to do. Now you need to call on the call center. And your choice option was to tell them what you, what you know. This is the call center folks coming into your office. <clears throat> and it didn't give you good points on this one. It says this may seem like a good choice, but it has you interacting with subordinates in a manner that's more befitting peers. Leadership is not always about sharing every bit of information. A better choice would have been to tell them what you don't, that you don't have answers quite yet, or in other words, balancing our leadership value of vision and knowledge. So you may want to hold back on what you do know until we have a little more comprehensive answer so that your response doesn't begin to potentially shake their inspiration. Okay. And finally, the feedback on the third one. This was where we talked to Yasher and our choice there that we made was to ask him what he thought about Julie's idea. These were your other choices. And the feedback on this one is that was probably the best thing to do. Gather information from him. Uh, rather than so you so you got one of them let's let's talk about this second one that we didn't do so well on Kenny okay? now the way that we do feedback becomes absolutely critical because what we want to do is elicit information from you and as a group we want to consider it so let's start how many of you actually chose to do this particular, this particular choice. Uh, tell them what you know. Okay. Why did you make that choice? 
Give me a couple of quick reasons. I felt it was showing leadership that you would be open and honest with your subordinates and tell them what you knew and don't try to hide things from them and don't make them think that, well, you're not telling them. Second. Excellent. Excellent. Some of the other groups, the other hands were up. Any different reasons? Same. Same reason? Any other different ones? Yeah, I remember being instructed once that that helps control the rumor mill when you put out what you know. Good, straight information and get it out there. Exactly. Good. It didn't look like there was anything sensitive that, of what he did know. And as far as, and I'm just from, drawn from my own experience, maybe someone else who's interested in that position, you know, they they may not say, so and so's been working in the call center. They have greater ideas than you as a person, but they weren't seen. So, I mean, it, it's a segue into that conversation of giving me input. You built the trust so they feel comfortable in sharing their thoughts and ideas. Very good, very good. Now, what's not so good yeah. about this answer? Yeah. Well, leading change initiatives doesn't mean necessarily telling everything that you know, but rather finding the information that's going to be most pertinent to those people in the position of your Excellent. So, so good leadership doesn't always mean telling them everything you need to know. It, it also means, as, as we heard this morning, it also means leading, showing the leadership, and keeping things positive. Excellent. I think by revealing that somebody important is leaving and taking another job, you could spook the whole herd and get everybody upset and thinking, should we all be considering you know, taking another job? You know, I, I found this, my brief yet illustrious career suggests that you now have an opportunity to keep people either focused on where we're going or spending a lot of time brushing up on resumes. And the object of the game is for us to keep people as engaged as possible. And that's the one thing that we really want to consider. So what I heard you say is, um, be careful on the when and the what we share because the ultimate goal is to keep people focused moving forward, isn't it? Excellent. Yeah, and I would rather reveal her departure coupled with, and her replacement is. Which is excellent, excellent, okay? Well, and, and that's kind of one of those trade-off ones, because, you know, to build trust is to be more revealing. So mm -hmm. you're withholding, so it could damage trust. So that, I think we talked earlier the other day about some of them have trade-offs. I think that would be an interesting trade-off to discuss. Is it more important to, you know, keep that the positive inspiration, or are you concerned with trust, or are you concerned with the team departing? So it's, it's kind of going through that critical thought process. Now, a real valuable thing for me to take a second to point out here is, listen to the content that's coming out, and we're and we're considering. I mean, was this important for us to hear? Yeah, because there's a lot of truth yes. to that. There, there's a lot of truth. But on the other side, there's a lot of truth over here, too. And we do. Most everything we do from a leadership position is trade-offs. And for me to think that, first of all, those four options that we had up there are the only options available. And that one is 100% satisfaction. In the sim, in this particular case, in order to evoke discussion, we gave you 100%. But the reality is, if I were to look at other scorecard items, my being straightforward with the team and providing them with information would probably not do a whole lot for upper management satisfaction. So there's going to be a trade-off. When I go directly to upper management and communicate with them first, I believe in my team hanging out there. You know, we're the guys on the ground that's making the money. How come you're choosing to communicate somewhere else first? There's always these kinds of trade-offs. And the fun thing is, simulation encourages this discussion. And as so now we've asked, what's good about this? What's not so good about this? Which one, which answer up here was the better answer? And what we would do is we would take time, if, we, if I had more time, we'd take the time to go through each of those choice options. Ask for their input. What's good about that one? You make them feel a part of what's going on. Good. I'm a part of what's going on, so I've got some ownership and some commitment there. What's not so good about that one? 
They may not need to know right now. Um, tell them what you don't that you don't have answers quite yet. What's good about that one? You get that message before you tell them. Gives me an opportunity to kind of prepare my message before it goes out. What's not so good about that one? It, it starts rumors, it increases rumors, there's an energy bleed that's probably going to happen. Mistrust. Mis it could ultimately end in mistrust. Excellent. Explain that things will be on hold for a while. What's good about that one? Now, I don't think anything good about that one. Good. We in, we're in agreement. What's bad about that one? Most everything. Good. It's not true. So what we have just got finished doing is we've done some critical thinking and we've considered options, but we haven't considered options outside of the sim. So what we like to do now is go and say, okay, in the real world, in your real world environment, what would be some additional options that would be even better than the four that we've given you? Uh, we kind of didn't do that, did we? She's out the door and we've just assumed that she's off into the hinterlands. Uh, th that was not a bad solution. What's good about talking to Julie? One, you can see if there's a possibility of retaining her, but she may have ideas of who's best. And she may have been grooming someone to replace her. Excellent, excellent. What other options? If you got some, this would be a perfect time to maybe implement your contingency plans. And we could go on and discuss lots more. And this is where the real learning starts to take place in the program, is that people are hearing comments from others and beginning to store that. Then the last thing that we do is we say, now, let's go to your environment, your job. And all of you would be here because you're probably in that C-suite at some point in time. We would say, how can we translate this into action? What are some ideas that some of you have had floating through your head while we've been discussing this up here? Did anybody learn something new? What? Well, that there's two sides to every point, you know. Uh, from our perspective, because we're not executives, we're seeing the side of the employees and the rumor mill and what have you, but on um, the other side of the coin, there's the executive team that who has to do got other, other things that uh, may come into play that we're not aware of. So um, you have the opportunity to, sh to share both sides of the coin in the discussion. Excellent. And taking a little bit of time to sit down and capture these learnings, and then what we do at the end of the program is have you translate these learnings into a to-do list. Now, based on what you've learned in the program, what are you going to do differently within the next 72 hours when you go back on the job? And one of the key learnings up here is you probably ought to groom a second in command and you probably should be spending sufficient time that you're getting their little ready to go light from a red up to a green so that when something like this happens, you've got kind of an automatic plan that's kind of been communicated and so when I go back, boy, I'm going to identify who's my next potential replacement. We put this in an organization that implemented the new rule, no one gets promoted until you have at least two viable replacements. And you should have seen the change that started to happen in that organization. Everybody went back and began to implement processes to groom a couple of replacements because they knew their number wouldn't come up for a promotion until they had two viable replacements. So okay. we're gonna have to, you know, the rest of the a lot of the materials that are in the rest of the PowerPoint which is posted um, really covers a lot of the, the discussion. I really I know that we're gonna end up working up against people's departure times. But I really want to get to uh, the module on social media with Ron. So one thing I do want to point out here is again you know part of the objective is really to Again, in an effort to expand your perspectives on how this, how the technology can be utilized, this was obviously not designed for this format. This was designed for small groups. But you can take any simulation that you may have and actually deploy it in large groups. I've run simulations like this for groups of 400 people, and we just use simply raising your hands. Um, the idea of engaging people in a story. Let me ask you a question. Did anybody miss video? No. Audio? No. 
Okay? So in terms of, of the starting point, there is a lot of room when you talk about the power of the story. And this wasn't obviously targeted at you. Did it kind of capture your attention? Were you engaged? Mm -hmm. So the, the power of the story, and some of the, you notice, they noticed the chuckles when you know, uh, Donald Trump it, and, and Dom Perignon, and, and little things that you can do that are endearing. That, and also can be used to set uh, Yasser Yevetia, um, because we're trying to indicate, we're trying to lead people down a path of, 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 of thinking. Uh, simple tools that you can use in terms of the, the power of the storytelling, but to engage people, which is obviously that first objective that we have engaged them, because then you're setting up the opportunity in whatever format to reach that opportunity for retrieval, for retention and retrieval. And so really, you know, uh, providing an opportunity for you to see a different approach that can still be, you know, all the tools are there, it's just a, a, how you end up applying them. We will post this sim, the link to the sim, um, on the website, so you'll be able to go back and actually play the whole round um, and see the feedback for yourself. I just want to add that what really made this work was we had a general <coughs> dynamic and great uh, instructor. Because that's not always the case. That helps. But I, but, I will, but I will tell you that a good sim will help any instructor. Because what you find is, is that when you blend it into, it makes the job of instructing easier because you have less to teach. Um, but it also gets the engagement in. So even if somebody's difficult to listen to, they become that much more interested in hearing what they have to say when they actually have been provoked into seeing what they don't know. And so, you know, again, it's the power of the blend. Nothing can be done. This sim would not work as well if it didn't have the teach associated with it. Uh, but nor would the teach work as well without the application attached to it. So it is important to maintain that focus on the blend. So I will um, want to turn over now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chad. Thank all of you. Appreciate it. Um, okay. So we're going to have. We're going to